So what is it then that politically destroyed the Irish Parliamentary Party and Redmond? Was it the rising? Was oh, it the conscription crisis? Was it a confluence of factors? Well, it's the rising and then it then moves into the conscription crisis. But before that, there is no question. If you look at the by-elections between the outbreak of the First World War and the Easter Rising in nationalist areas, and there are several contested ones, I don't think they're awfully great for Redmond's politics, but they do win them all. I mean, there are radical type nationalists who, who have views similar maybe to the insurrection put up in certain places and do reasonably well. But really, they do win them all quite comfortably. So I would not claim that the by-elections show resounding support for Redmond. They don't. But they do show that he had the support of the majority of Irish nationalists before the Easter Rising. And that's another reason why when Michael McDonough meets him in, in London shortly before 1916 Rising, he is so confident about the future. Mm. Uh, uh, Redmond was confident about the future. Uh, how has he been viewed then by, by particularly Northern Unionists, uh, faced with the prospect of, uh, of home rule uh, taking effect mm. after the war uh, and, and seeing this, uh, apparently, the success of Redmond's policy? How was he perceived uh, by, by... Well, there's no question that he, 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 he's not a popular figure, except uh, uh, the, the, with Carson it's more complicated because Carson and Redmond have uh, certain things in common, Trinity the Irish bar. There's a certain cultural commonality between the two, and you can see the way they interact together, that there is a, 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 a regard for each other as gentlemen in politics. There's a connection, for example, that really has not been there if you look at leaders of unionism in the north and leaders of Irish politics in the south in the hundred years that followed, to be honest. So there's actually a closer connection there. But at the popular level, Redmond was a figure of fear. There is an argument here uh, which is ex about how Redmond might have handled this. And it's, it's a, a very brilliant book by one of his MPs, Stephen Gwynne, Galway M Nationalist MP. And Stephen Gwynne says in John Redmond's last years that Redmond should have done the big thing and grasped what we now call the consent nettle openly and strongly and that Irishmen respond to doing the big thing in an open way instead of what happened is that Redmond was pushed and slubbed and slid into a, 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 a last minute acceptance uh, a, 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 by 1916 of some form of partition but basically there's an argument that had he moved earlier say in 1914 he could have actually not averted partition, but ensured that it came about on a basis which was not, so, not as harmful as it subsequently became. Mm. But Redmond can at least claim that the arrangements that he knew that he was going to get would not lead to the establishment of the institutions of the Stormont Parliament in the, in the North. It would have been direct rule, and it would have been direct rule in which, because you kept Irish members at Westminster, Irish members would be able to play a role in seeing how it operated.